Sunday nights, we are in a study on the book of Revelation. We've been studying it from the uh, viewpoint of the number seven. Because in the book of Revelation, you've got sevens throughout the book. And seven is probably uh, the most prominent number among the Jews. All the numbers had an exact meaning. Now, the book of Revelation is a Jewish book. And, of course, the word revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O-K-A. L-U-P-S-I-S. That is the word revelation. It comes from apo. That means off or a removal. And the word kalupto. K-A-L-U-P-T-O. The word kalupto is the word cover. It means to remove the cover. It has the, it has the meaning of the, it's the exact opposite as the word truth Oh, excuse me. It has the same meaning as the word truth. Excuse me. It has the exact opposite of the word mystery. And it has the same meaning as the word truth. Truth, of course, is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. And that word aletheia comes from lanthano. Lanthano means to lie hid, placing the alpha privative in front of the word, negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. The word alanthano translates aletheia, and it is the word truth. It means not to hide anything or not to cover anything up. So truth in Revelation would have the same idea. Of course, the word mystery is the word musturion, M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, musturion. And that comes from, we get the word muo. From that, we get our word mute, meaning to shut the mouth. Shut the mouth and not say the truth. And whenever something is a mystery, is a long, as you don't know who killed the guy. When Columbo comes along and he goes through about 45 minutes, he starts telling you how the guy was killed and who did it. And whenever it is finally revealed, it's no longer a mystery. It's no longer hidden. A mystery means something that's hidden. Now, the book of Revelation is not hard to understand when you define words and you define meanings. And the main thing we want to define in the book of Revelation is the sevens. We've done this each week for, we've been in the book of Revelation for about 34 weeks. And of course, uh, uh, turn to Revelation, the first chapter, one more time, first chapter. In the first chapter of Revelation, we find some things that are very significant. And this opens the key to the book of Revelation. I've never heard a preacher that I believe understood anything about Revelation. I never heard a Bible teacher that I believe really understood it, particularly Hal Lindsey and Jack Van Empey. They are not scholars. They do not know what they're talking about. They do not define the words. They're just as lost as a goose uh, in the dark out here when it comes to this book. Now, the two verses particularly that you need to look at are verse 1 and verse 20. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel. Of course, signify is the word semiao, S-E-M-E-I-O-O. -O. It comes from the word simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. That is the word sign. One of the common words for sign or miracle. <clears throat> and the word actually means a flag or a beacon. It's the same thing as a sign. I've said it before. Whenever you think of a sign, what do you think of? Well, you go down the street and it says Kmart. You want to buy it. That's a sign. That's a beacon. What that tells you is you can buy all kinds of, uh, you go in here and buy tires, you can buy hairspray. That's what that's saying to us. Or you can go down the road and you can see this. I've said before, but you can see this little, this little cross uh, bars here and you see this little track going along here and you see something and these red lights are going ding, 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 ding. That means there's a train coming and a little bar comes across there. That's a signal or it's a sign and what that means, there's a train coming. Well, all through this, these signs, they're beacons and they're pictures to tell us what's going on. In the book of Revelation, all of these these uh, pictures that we see, they're allegories, they're spiritual pictures, and they are, uh, they're signs or they're flags or they're beacons. I like what Mr. Fairburn says, Patrick Fairburn says, that when you look at the book of Revelation and you see the dragon and you see, uh, the, uh, you see uh, the seven head and ten horned beast, these are more or less like political cartoons. 
first of all, you have to know what the... We've gone through the seven heads. We've gone through the ten horns. We've gone through the, the dragon. Of course, the word dragon doesn't mean some fire-breathing dragon. It is the word D-R-A-K-O-N, dracon. And dracon meant a serpent, but it was more than just a serpent. When, you think, when we think of dragons, and we think of the flying dragon with the wings that look like the bat wings and got the ribs in it, that's not a dragon at all. Uh, that's something that was in medieval times when you would have all of these myths about St. George killing the dragon and all of this. That's not what it is. The word dragon is the word dracon, and it means to fascinate. And of course, that's what the serpent did in the garden. He fascinated Eve. The word serpent in Genesis 3.1, nakosh. Nakosh means to enchant, or it means to make somebody feel good. That's what the doctrine of Satan is. It's a feel-good doctrine, and that's what the dragon does. That's the easy gospel that's being preached from the mouth of these false teachers. Well, we've been looking at the word number seven. In, since this is a Jewish book, you've got the temple in here, you've got the altar of incense, you have the, you've got, here you've got the, uh, you've got the temple, you've got the altar, you, ha you have the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you got the veil, you have the altar of incense, the seven candlesticks, the table of showbread, the brazen sea, and the altar, the brazen altar where all the sacrifices were offered. You have all of this in the book of Revelation. That is Jewish. We have the sevens throughout the book of Revelation. I'll read them one more time. Seven heads, seven crowns, seven last plagues, seven golden vials, seven mountains, seven kings, seven churches of Asia, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven candlesticks, seven lamps, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, and seven thunders. Of course, being a Jewish book, we have to go back to the meaning of the number seven. Now, in the Old Testament scriptures, the number seven, the number seven uh, is the cardinal number is the word Sheba. It is the same word for the queen of Sheba, uh, her title, it, or the queen of seven. is what it actually means. It comes from the word Sheba. And Shabbat, these come from the exact same root. The theological word book of the Old Testament will tell you. They're the exact same root in the Hebrew. And the word Sheba is the number seven. And the word Shabbat means to take an oath. Take an oath. Or it means to complete. Seven is a number of completion in our lives. And it means to uh, seven oneself. That's what it means. To seven one's self. That's what the word Shabbat means. Taking an oath meant to be sevened. And we've talked about in, in Second Peter uh, 1 and 5 where, where uh, Peter says, Besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And he names one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things. And we become sevened and we have to, when we're studying Revelation, we have to look and realize that the number seven is not so much used as a cardinal number as it is used as a descriptive term. Uh, I would say if a man is going through all kinds of fiery trials and God are going through a blood baptism, which was a death, if a man is going through years of fiery trials, he comes to the place where he is being sevened. Of course, that, that list uh, starts off with virtue and it ends with agape. Now, I don't have time to go through all that. I've gone through that before. Uh, and it, we have to add these things, and that's what completes us in Christ. And after God puts you through all kinds of fiery trials through years, that's what will happen to your life. So when we look at the Scriptures, when we see uh, in the first chapter of Revelation, we see seven churches in verse 4, seven spirits in verse 5, the seven churches in verse 11, we see the seven candlesticks... In verse 12, and of course the seven candlesticks, that was Jewish furniture in the temple on the south side of the temple. And uh, the, uh, not, not the uh, sanctuary, but in the outer part of the tabernacle. And, in them, and then seven candlesticks in verse 13. Seven stars in the right hand of Christ in verse 16. The right hand was the hand of authority. And we find the definition of these in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. 
Verse 20 is a glossary for the rest of the book. Glossary comes from glossa, meaning a foreign language. And a glossary is a section of a book that will explain the difficulties of the book to you. So, the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels. Well, how many, how many, how many stars are there? Seven. How many angels will there be? Seven. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Yeah, that's the seven candlesticks. That's the, they are the angels. The angels, the word angel, of course, is the word angelos. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And that word angelos means messenger. It doesn't mean some heavenly being. Could be a heavenly being. But all the preachers and pastors of the churches we're called angels or messengers. Well, they should be because that's the common word for angel in the, in the Greek. It means a preacher or a messenger of God. Now, we find here that the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And I've said this before. The oil inside the candlesticks, that's the angels or the message. And the message is no good without a container. The container is no good without the message. What comes out of the top of the candlesticks is light. That is the truth. When the oil inside is, is, is lit and put on fire, then you've got a sevened church. It is one menorah. It's not seven candlesticks. It's one with seven different arms on it. That's what it's talking about. And it's an allegorical picture of the refined church when the church is seven. Now we've gone through, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've got the, in the second in third chapter, you've got the seven churches. There were more than seven churches, more than seven churches in Asia. You had the church of Troas. You had the church of Colossia. These are not listed as, you had the church at Mileta over here. These were not listed as part of the seven churches. You had many churches in Asia. I believe that John, that God had John pick out seven of them to show the refinement of of the church, when the church is refined, they will begin to declare the truth. Well, then you get on over into uh, chapter 4, and you find the throne of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you find the 24 elders, those are the 24 sons of Eleazar and Ithamar, that cast their golden crowns uh, before the feet of Christ, who is the true high priest of God. And I don't have time to go through that. Then you start the seven seals in chapter 5. Chapter 6, you've got the... Uh, the seals being opened, uh, you have the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast, the first four seals. We're not going to stop there in the seventh chapter. We've got all of the elect of God being marked in their foreheads. And this, these are the saints. You also have the saints around the throne of God, those that have been persecuted and died for their beliefs in the seventh chapter. The eighth chapter, you see these same seven angels in verse 2, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and we're going to be changed at the last trump. Now, I want us to read that. Let's read the, the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15, because I'm, I'm, I'm going through the 20th chapter of Revelation. Look at 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. We're going to read this tonight, because I've said this over and over. Now, something that people miss... When we're discussing the thousand years and we're discussing rapture, the thing they miss more than anything else, we are not denying that Christ is coming back. We're denying that he's coming at a pre-trib rapture. We deny that because, uh, mainly because if there's a... Here's the way that... Let me erase this and put it back up on the board how the dispensationalists say this is going to happen. I need to put this back up going into the 20th chapter because there's something, there has to be an insistence on people dealing with which your supposedly uh, most famous scholars, they're not scholars, they're not learning, your most famous scholars will not deal with the two things, well, I, they actually are one thing, time element time element of his coming of Jesus coming that no one's dealing with the time element of his coming they just say he's coming pre-trib 
his coming. You have to deal with the time factor or the time factor. Let's call it a time factor. No one talks about where does the Bible say that he's going to come at what time factor do, does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 tells us what the time factor of Christ's coming is. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep was a term that was used for people who had died in Christ. They were dead believers, and they'd gone on to be with the Lord. Those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The point is not whether we're going to be changed or not. The point is, concerning the time factor, whether we will go through tribulation, is when will the change come? We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, I read somewhere, I can't remember exactly what it was, but the eye twinkles at something like one one hundredth of a second, the twinkle of an eye. Not, not the blinking of an eye, but the twinkle. Twinkle is some very my, minute amount of time. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye so no one is going to be able to look up at the sky and say, there's Jesus. Uh, uh, I hope I'm ready. Uh, gosh, I'm scared. No, it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. Now, the time factor is the next phrase. We're going to be changed at the last trump. That's the change. Last trump. Last trump. That's when our change will be. Why these guys never address this, it is beyond me. I don't know why they don't address it. They're scared of it, I guess. I've heard them, I heard uh, David Brees quote, we're going to be, behold, I show you mystery, we shall all sleep. We'll all be changed in a moment in the twink of an eye. Now, let's talk about this. Just ignored at the last trump. At the last trump, a last is, of course, through the word E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. Eschatos, when you go into uh, Mr. Thayer's, I thought I had a Thayer's up here. I believe I do somewhere. Mr. Thayer's lexicon of the New Testament, he will tell you the word last means the last in a series after, this is his words in Thayer's lexicon, after which no other trumpet will sound. That's what he says in his lexicon. Well, it has to be that because it is grammatically that way. The word, we get the word eschatology from that word eschatos. When you go to a seminary and you study eschatology, that is the study of end-time prophecy. Eschatos, it actually comes from the word echo. Now, echo, we think of an echo as sounds. Echo is the common Greek word for hold. It means to hold something is what it means. Now, we think of an echo as holding a sound. Well, to them, that also meant to hold a sound. And the sound that's held is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trumpets. There will be seven trumpets, and those seven trumpets begin with the seven angels in Revelation, the eighth chapter, when these seven angels have seven trumpets, and we've already gone through it, but one more time, I'm going back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. We see the first trumpet sounding in verse 7. Now remember, trumpets are voices. Scripture will define these things for us. Uh, you remember the word, the word trumpet there in Revelation 1 and verse 10? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Well, these are called trumpets on the candlesticks. These are seven trumpets. They sound the light or they sound the truth. It's what they do. And when the church is sevened or completed or refined, then the church will sound. Now, look here. We've got the first trumpet sounding in, in verse 7. We've already gone through this. I've gone through the 
what happens at the different trumpets, what happens at the different vials. Verse 8, the second trumpet sounds. Verse 10, the third trumpet sounds. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded. Verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. Remember, the seven angels are the message within the trumpets. These are voices. And the seven angels are the seven stars. So when the stars begin to fall to the earth, this is the judgment of God from the refined church. This, the fifth angel sounded. Verse chapter 9, verse 1. Chapter 9, in verse 14, the sixth angel sounds, or the verse 13 and 14, the sixth angel sounded. This is the sixth trumpet. And you've got seven trumpets that sound. And at chapter 10, verse 7, when the angel puts one foot on the land and the other on the sea and says, time will be no longer from verse 6, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, or the last angel, when he shall begin to sound, this is the last trump, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. You've got two mysteries. You have the mystery of God, or the mystery of Christ, and the mystery of iniquity. And the mystery of Christ, if a mystery is something that's hidden, it's hidden to those that are lost out there in the world because they're not elect and they can't hear. So it's a mystery to people that don't understand these things. We were sitting at dinner today and we was talking about uh, the wickedness of the world, the wickedness of America, uh, the wickedness of everybody, the wickedness of the Iranians over here, the Iraqis over here, the Americans over here, the Russians over here. Everybody is wicked unless they are in truth, unless Christ is birthed in them, unless they believe these truths about a daily cross, death to self, self-denial. If a man that's not in that, he cannot see the truth, not only about God, he can't see the truth about this world, about this nation, about this country, how all men drink iniquity like water that are outside the new birth of Christ. The mystery of God should be finished. That's the church, according to the third chapter of Ephesians and according to the uh, uh, fifth chapter of Ephesians. Christ said, uh, Paul said, I speak... A mystery in you, I speak of Christ and His church. So, at the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is finished. I'm not going to go into that. I, it take me about 30 minutes to go through that. What is it, Mary? What is it? This is the refined church. This is allegory. Well, uh, Mary, this is a refinement. I don't know when the trumpets start sounding. The trumpet sounds when we are refined as the church. It looks to me, the way we're preaching across America in these TV uh, stations, preaching predestination and death to self and daily cross and Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan and America's corrupt and America's Babylon, it looks like we're pulling a lot of people out. Uh, we're reaching the elect of God that want these truths and the church is going to be refined, and as the church is refined, they'll be sevened, and they'll be preaching these judgments of God. I do not know how the trumpets line up in Scripture. What I'm teaching is that they happen at the end of time, and when the last one sounds, the mystery of God is over. It's finished. The church is complete. There'll be no need for the church to remain here any longer. Remember the seven trumpets of of uh, Joshua when he marched around Jericho for seven days, seven priests had seven trumpets on the seventh day. They marched down around seven times. And when the seventh one sounded, that they shouted and the walls fell down. Judgment came on the sounding of the seventh trump. And of course, we've talked about... Now, I've looked at that for years. I cannot tell you when the trumpets begin sounding. But it will be the refined church that begins to speak the truth. I know that God's dealt with me to say the truth because what I'm saying is very unpopular. People would like to come and kill me for saying these words. That's what it's going to result in when the church rises up. And I'm not talking about the Baptist church. I'm not talking about the Pentecostal or the Charismatic church. Those people are not telling the truth. I'm talking about the called out, the ecclesia, the called out of God. When we're refined and we start saying the truth, the trumpets begin sounding. Now, I don't know if that's like a beginning of the church 
rising up and pulling out of this world system. But that's what we're doing. And when we're on TV in Fort Wayne and we're on in Chicago and we're on in Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston and, and uh, Brooklyn, Queens and Staten Island and Manhattan and around the country, when the, when the people of God hear this, they start coming out. I, I would love to think that we're having something to do with getting this message out to people in America. We may be a small part, but whatever part we are, we are a part of the refined church speaking out the truth. As to the time beginning of when they begin and when they end, that's not up to us to know. There are things at the end I can't see. There's things at the end I'm certainly not going to write these so-called prophecy preachers and ask them. The main thing is we're going to be changed at the last trump. That's what we're discussing. Now, the, these, these uh, time factor is the key. Last trump is the key. If you can show trumpets at the end of time, then we know that we're going to be changed when that last trumpet sounds. Well, if you'll notice here, in, in chapter 10 and verse 6, the angel which, what he says in verse 5, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, I want you to notice, right before the seventh trumpet sounds, the scripture is announcing the end of time is here, right? Right? But what bothers people, they say, well, how can this be the end of time? We're not at the end of the book. You have, these are not, these are not visions in a sequence, one following another like this. That's not what they are. They are visions that John is having. It's a panoramic view, and some of them show a view of the end of time over here in this vision. Some show a view of the end of time over here. You have the end of time in Revelation 6. You have the end of time in Revelation 8. You have the end of time in Revelation 10. You have the re end of time in Revelation 11. You have the end of time in Revelation 14 where Jesus treads the wine press. You have the end of time in Revelation 16. You have the end of time in Revelation 18. And you have the end of time in Revelation 19. It's different views. It's what it is. That's what disturbs people because you've got the end of time here in the 10th chapter. It's not because this is a sequential event. These are simultaneous views of uh, much of the visions of the same happening. So right before the last trumpet sounds, the Bible says the angel, which I believe is Christ, I'm not going to go into that, he puts one foot on the land, other on the sea, says time will be no more and then the seventh trumpet sounds. That's what I want you to really pay attention to. And one other thing happens at the sounding of the last trump. Chapter 11, verse 15, you also have the end of time here because the trumpet sounds here. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All the kingdoms of the world are conquered at the sounding of the seventh trump, aren't they? All the kingdoms of the world. What is the last enemy that shall be destroyed, according to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians? Death is God's last enemy. So at the sounding of the seventh trump, at the sounding of the seventh trump, Signing of seventh trump. Two things happen. That is the last trump. Last trump. Well, let's put it this way. Let's say there's three things that happen. Okay? Let's just put it like this. We know at the signing of the seventh trump we're going to be changed, aren't we? Or the last trump changed at last trump. And we know that the mystery of God is finished. Mystery of God finished. And that word finished, of course, is the word T-E-L-E-I-O-T-E-S. The mystery of God has been sevened at this point. The entire church has been completed. That word means to be complete. And 
number three. I usually put it as two. I make it just the mystery of God finished. And he conquers all his enemies. Conquers all enemies. That's right. And the last enemy that be destroyed, last enemy, is death. So therefore, when he conquers the last enemy, all of his enemies are conquered, and the last enemy is death. Therefore, when we are changed, when the mystery of God is finished, death is destroyed. That's why I said it last week, and I've got to go back to the 20th chapter. You've got something called dispensationalism. The dispensationalists say time is divided up into sections. They say that, well, from Adam until Noah, they lived in innocence. They lived according to innocence, and they let their innocence rule them. And from Noah until the law, they lived under conscience. And this, this is so much baloney is what it is. You have to insert this stuff in the Bible because the Bible doesn't teach that. Then you have the law up to Christ. And you have the law in this section right here. And then they say, you have after that, you have the church age. Church age. Even though the Bible speaks of the church being with Moses in the wilderness in the seventh chapter of Acts... They say you have the church age. Then they say that is from Christ until the seven-year tribulation starts. And then they say that as of the church age, you have, uh, excuse me, as of the tribulation, they say this is for the Jews only to convert the Jews. Now, I don't know how the Jews are going to be converted, the literal Jews, when the church goes out of here. The Holy Spirit's going to be in the church and the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of here and the Holy Spirit is the truth. How's anybody going to be believers when there is no Holy Spirit or no truth here? That's just not true. And then, of course, they say there's a thousand-year reign after this is over. We don't believe in a thousand-year reign. We don't believe in a pre-trib rapture because, mainly I said it last week, because they, the, the, the dispensationalists, the word dispensation is the word O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A. Oikonomia, it means to dispense. It is the same word stewardship. Stewardship is the same word dispensation. Well, a steward was the head of a household that distributed the economy of a household. He's the man that paid the bills, made sure the servants were taken care of, made sure they uh, would eat. A, that is a stewardship. Well, we had stewardship all through the Old Testament. They did not live under the law. They lived by grace through faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. It was grace and faith that saved Noah. It was not the law or conscience or innocence. They were saved by the grace of God the same way we are. Joyce asked me before we started tonight, what about the Mosaic law? Do we still have the Mosaic law? We have the law, and it was, and God gave it to Moses. The only thing that has been blotted out, according to Colossians 2.14, blotted out is the ritual of the law. Ritual of the law are the ordinances. The law contained in ordinances that were written. The law was written on tables of stone in the Old Testament. The law is written on fleshy tables of the heart now. Uh, they had a temple in the Old Testament. We are the temple of God now. The temple is called the house of God. We are God's house in Hebrews 3 and 6. Uh, they had an Ark of the Covenant over there in the Old Testament. That Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled on the 10th day of the 7th month. Our hearts are sprinkled now. There was a priest and king over there. We're priests and kings now. Everything that was once literal, literal is now spiritual. The only thing we have a, I've gone through it, we had, they had a Passover over here. We have a spiritual Passover now. They had a day of atonement over here. We have a spiritual atonement. Atonement is where they sprinkle the blood upon the Ark of the Covenant. We are elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood in 1 Peter 1 and 2. So everything, the law is still here. The rituals are not here. The literal is not here. The spiritual is here. It's still here. 
we're still obedient to the law of God, not in order to be saved, not in order to be a son, but because we are sons of God, and He's going to perform that in us and cause us to do that. Now, I do not believe in dispensationalism at all because it only means a stewardship or a dispensing. When you find the word dispensation, it has the same mean, same exact definition, same spelling as stewardship. That's what it means. Now, the, now most of the world, anytime you find these guys on TV preaching, uh, preaching prophecy, they are dispensationalists. That's Hal Lindsey, that's Jack Van Empey, that is David Brees, that's all these guys who claim to be uh, who claim to be prophecy scholars. They haven't even bothered to define the word dispensation. They never bothered to do that. It doesn't mean periods of time. It has to do with the dispensing of the law of God. It comes from nomos. The word dispensation comes from oikos, O-I-K-O-S. That means house or family. And the word nomos, that is the Greek word law. It means the law of the household of God. We are God's house. That's all it means. And we dispense the household of God. We dispense the word of God and take care of the people and the family and the house of God. That's what we do. We are all stewards of God. It means to dispense. It's the dispensing of grace. Where people get confused, grace was only given up to up to the time of Christ, grace was only given to the Jewish flesh. Now the Lord is pouring out of His Spirit on all flesh, and that's for the last 2,000 years of time. Now, <clears throat> just let me review it for you real quickly. Remember, <clears throat> we've got a verification of last trumpet in, uh, in three places in Scripture. You've got the last trumpet of Revelation 10 and 7 and 11 and 15. That's one place. You got the last trump with Joshua when he marches around Jericho. Over there in, in Joshua the 6th chapter, he marches around Jericho. And at the sounding of the 7th to the last trump, the walls fall down. And then you had seven trumpets. You had seven trumpets that were sounded throughout the ecclesiastical calendar of the Jewish year. The Jewish year started in our month. They had several calendars they went by. But they had an ecclesiastical uh, calendar, and that started in the month of Nisan. Nisan was our month, March, April. And it went through seven straight months. One, one two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh month was Tishri, or Tishra, however you want to pronounce it. Tishri, and that's the seventh month. That was the month of ingathering, where the crops were gathered in. That is a picture of us being gathered in. And the ingathering was coupled with the Day of Atonement. Atonement. At the first of each one of those months, they had a new moon festival. A new moon. And at the sounding of the New Moon Festival, each month for seven straight months, they sounded a trumpet. And at the sounding of the seventh trump, at the end gathering, the whole idea was they gathered the crop in at the sounding of the seventh trump. We are going to be gathered in at the sounding of the seventh or the last trump. Whether people like that or not, whenever you can find trumpets at the end of time, when you find trumpets still sounding, the last one hadn't sounded yet until the end of time comes. There's two other places that this is very important. Matthew 24 and verse 29. When the apostles come to Jesus and say, Lord, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of thy coming? The sign of your parousia. This is very important. This is very, let me go back to this because I've got to show you this. I don't know if I pointed this out to you. I keep going through this, and I can't go back to the 20th chapter until I go through this. Go back to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew 24. Now, the apostles come to Jesus, and they say to him, When will these things be, when one stone will not be left upon another? There in 
Well, he says to them, they show him the temple and the buildings of the temple. And Jesus says to him in verse 2, See ye all, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, they couldn't understand that because the temple, it covered an area of about 28 acres. And the stones were like 20 and 30 and 40 tons. And they, they were built, the temple was supposedly built something like the pyramids, so magnificent they said this will last to the end of time. So when they ask him the question, they couple the fact that they believe that the temple will last to the end of time with the question concerning the end of time. And they say to him, and as he sat up on the Mount of Olives in verse 3, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What are they talking about? The temple where not one stone will be left upon another. They could not see that in 70 A.D. that Titus, the son of Vespasian, the barbarian, would come in and level the temple. They couldn't see it. 70 years down the road, well not 70 years, about 35 years down the road, because Jesus it is, is in his early 30s at this point, and it was in 70 A.D., so just a little over 35 years later, there's no way they could see the temple level. So they said, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, the word coming is very interesting. It's the word parousia. And it means your physical presence. When the Bible would speak of Timothy went into such and such a town and he came to the town or his parousia was at a certain time. That meant that he arrived there, his physical presence. You cannot use this, and I haven't pointed this out to you in a long time. They said, what will be the sign of your physical arrival? Not as the Jehovah's Witness. Well, he came and in, in, they kept saying, he's coming in 1914. Uh, well, I'm glad he didn't because my father was born that year and I would never have been around. And then finally, after the time passed, after 1914 passed, the Jehovah's Witness started saying, well, it came spiritually in 1914. <clears throat> That's not what this is saying. What is the time? Not of your spiritual arrival. Some people say, well, it came in Acts 2. No, that was the spiritual presence of Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, what is going to be the sign of your physical arrival? That's the point. Not what's the, going to be the coming of your spiritual presence. Not it. What's going to be the sign of that coming? And of course, he goes through all of these things here, uh, this being deceived and nation rising against nation and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places and being delivered up to be afflicted in verse 9 and so forth and all the way through here. And then he says down here in verse, and he says, if anyone says he's in the secret chamber, believe it not, go not forth. Don't believe Benny Hinn when he says he saw Jesus uh, in some physical presence in a, in a prayer tower. Don't believe Oral Roberts when he saw a 900 foot Jesus. Uh, they're lying. Jesus is telling the truth. Then he says in verse 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the physical arrival. That's the point. As the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall also the physical presence of the Son of Man be. All the world shall see Him. And then he says, verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the time factor after the tribulation. Then it goes all the way through here talking about after the tribulation. Everything that happens from this point on throughout this, the rest of this chapter is about the context is after the tribulation. Well, that's time factor, time element here. So all we need to do is go over here after the tribulation of those days Verse 31, after the tribulation of those days, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The last one has not sounded before the end of the tribulation, has it? There cannot be a pre-trib rapture trumpet 
and then some trumpets at the end of time because we're going to be changed at the last trump and we've got the seventh trumpet of Revelation 10 and 7, 11 and 15 and we've got the last trump. We've got angels sounding with trumpets here in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Now that's very important. Now what I'm trying to get back to is to go back over well, let me give you one other thing that's very important. Very important. The favorite verse, probably the favorite verse of the pre-trib rapturist is in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. I review this because I have to go back through it. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. This is a favorite verse of the pre-trib rapturist. Let me erase some of this. I don't like that dispensationalism on my board. Let me erase it up. Get that stuff off of there. All right. That's right. Yeah. What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? When will these things be? They thought the temple would last to the end of time. They could not possibly see it devastated in 70 AD. They couldn't see it. So they coupled that. What will be the sign of your physical arrival? That's what they're saying. Jesus said, the next time the world sees me physically, it will be as the lightning shineth out of the east even to the west. That's what he said. No, he didn't even touch that. They coupled it with the end of the world. Not Jesus. They coupled it because they said, I mean, the 70 AD is a long time from the end of the world, isn't it? Yeah, they hit on that. That's right. No. Yeah. That's what they're trying to say. Preterism is a... I've gone through some of that. I'm not going to go through that. Now I've got so many places to go here. Now, one other place where they like... Time factors the whole thing. Time element is everything. Here in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, Paul is talking to the Thessalonian believers. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died in the Lord, that ye saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The whole idea is when is this going to be? When is this coming back and when is he bringing these saints back? This is at the end of time is what it is because we've got a trumpet sounding here, don't we? We have a shout here. <clears throat> For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. We know what we've been, we've been talking about tribulation and going under fiery trials here at the end of time. We've been talking about the little, se the le little season of Satan the little season, we've been talking about all the trials and tribulation, how the church is going to go under great tribulation such as was not from the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be. Now, here's what really gets me. These people will say, well, there's got to be a pre-trib rapture because God wouldn't beat up his church. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in the world. The stupidest statement I ever heard. You've got to have a, the church taken out at the beginning of the seven years because God wouldn't beat up his wife. Wait a minute. What they're saying is God wouldn't beat up his wife in America. That's what they mean. Because right now, before the seven years tribulation, men have paid with their lives for the last 2,000 years. 60 million died in the Inquisition. When they had the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917, to be a Christian in Russia for years... They paid with their lives. They paid with their lives through the centuries. A thousand years ago, they were dying. What do you mean God won't beat up his wife? That's not beating up his wife to, to have his wife persecuted and go through the fiery trials. Because the rest of the... We're only 4.2% of the world's population now. We used to be 46 the world is outgrowing us. We're only about 4.2% of the world's population. God, what they mean is God won't beat, his, beat up his wife in America because the church has been suffering throughout the world for 2,000 years. Being killed for their testimony. That's what Revelation 6 tells us about, doesn't it? 
those under the fifth seal, they cried, How long, O Lord? They have died for their testimony. Uh, the reasoning behind pre-trib rapture is some of the worst theology I have ever heard in my life. It bothered me as a little kid. I, I listened to my dad teach and he said, Between this verse and this verse is the rapture. And I'd be going, Huh? Where does it say that? Now, these main, the main three things you need to keep remembering. Revelation 10 and 7, 11 and 15, Matthew 24, 29 through 31, and right here in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 13, down through verse 17. Let's finish reading. We which are alive and remain... Remain does not mean I'm working my job, I'm going to work, I'm paying my car note. Uh, I'm remaining, I'm, I'm going back and forth to work, and I'm doing my things here in the United States of America that I'm supposed to be doing. I'm remaining. And that's not the word. The word is perilipo, P-E-R-I, L-E-I-P-O. That word means to survive some great onslaught, some great slaughter. We which remain, we which are alive, and survive the great slaughter of the church shall not, we which are alive and remain, survive the great slaughter unto the parousia, physical presence, physical arrival. When that's, when's that going to be? At the last trump, after the tribulation of those days. Shall not prevent, means to go before. We will not go up to meet the Lord in the air before those that are asleep in Christ, that have died for their testimony, or they've died through the last 2,000 years. We'll not go before them. But we, for the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, just the definition of the word shout and the definition of the word remain keep this from being a pre-trib rapture. What they tell you, what the, what the pre-trib rapturists tell you, they tell you that here you've got, they say, here's the church age, here's the pre-trib rapture, and here's the end of time, and the seven years is for the Jews is what they say. And they say, this coming of Jesus in the skies, they say, that's a trumpet that only the saints will hear, and it will be a secret coming. That's what they say. It'll be a secret coming that only the saints will hear. Jesus said, the scripture says, every eye shall see him. Jesus said, as the lightning shining from the east, even to the west. That's the way the Son of Man will come. Do they think that's going to be secret? I've said it before. How does the lightning shine from the east to the west? Like this. God's going to rip the top off. That's what he's going to do. Now, for the Lord himself, when you define the word shout, it sets a time factor. It cannot be a secret coming. This the context of this verse cannot be a secret coming by mere definition of the word shout. This equates with the shout of Joshua the sixth chapter when the seventh trumpet sound and they shouted. This equates here because this is the word kaluo, K E L L E U O. K E L L E U O. That word shout, now how can this be a secret coming? When the word shout is a war cry given by a commander to his troops. How can that be secret? If this is a secret coming, who is he making war with at the secret coming? It's a war cry. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With a war cry, attack! With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the last one hasn't sounded yet, has it? Huh? And this is those that remain, or they survive the great holocaust, the great onslaught, the slaughter of the church. There'll be some of the church left, and there will be no flesh saved, except he shortened those days, because the church would be annihilated if he didn't shorten them. There is going to be 
an attack on the church. And you know what it's going to be for? For preaching what I'm preaching from this pulpit. They'll come and get me first. If I'm, if I'm here when this starts, I believe that just as sure as I'm standing here. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're going out of here one day. We may have to be slaughtered first, some of us, but the few that are alive and remain will remain to the shout and the last drum. Now let's go back to Revelation, the 20th chapter. What? Okay. Yeah. Well, Mary, asleep was a term that was used for the dead elect. You remember me saying that in John 11? In John 11, Jesus came back from Perea. Lazarus had died. He had laid in the grave four days. He came back, and Jesus said to the apostles, He sleepeth. The apostles said, well, if he's asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. You've got two parts to the body that dies. You've got the spirit and the body, don't you? Huh? Let me explain it to you, Mary. Those which sleep in Jesus, the body is over in the grave, it's asleep. But to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. So, and that's not for everybody. That's for the elect only. For us to be absent in this body, look at that. In, look at 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Look at 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Second <clears throat> Corinthians 5, verse Paul's talking about longing for our house made without, made with, we have a building of God and house not made with hands in verse 1, eternal in the heavens, and for this we groan. We're groaning for our new house. We groan. Remember the word groan? Stenazzo. S-T-E-N-A-Z-O. Stenazzo comes from stenos. Stenos is the word straight. Straight is the gate. Uh, that leads to life, narrows the way, and few there be that find it. When we're entering through the straight gate, we're making the groans. It's not a literal groan. It's, I said this morning, it's when we get together and go, oh, man, I talked to my family, and they don't want the truth, and we groan together, and we moan, and we say, oh, Lord, come soon. That's the groaning we're making. For in this we groan earnestly, designed to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. I, and you don't really desire that house from heaven till you get to groaning so much. You start talking truth. You start living in truth. It just makes you miserable. And truth is the most miserable, wonderful, happy thing you can live in. <clears throat> it is. It's miserably happy. We're miserable when we're in the world and we're happy when we're with each other. Jerry says he looks forward to Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays. And he, he goes to school and he teaches just anxious for Wednesday. And he goes and he's anxious for Friday. And he's anxious for Sunday. Yeah. We're looking forward. We're looking forward to getting out of these bodies. I wasn't looking forward to getting out of this body when I was 35 as a believer. I wasn't looking forward when I was 30. But the longer you live in the truth, the more miserable you get, the more you fight your family, the more you fight your friends. A man's supposed to be those of his own household. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. In the world you shall have tribulation. Yet all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so on and so on and so on. The more we go through that, the more we are groaning, longing for our house from heaven. Let's go on and read this. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. And we're going to be clothed with our new house. That's our new body. For we that are in the tabernacle do groan, stenazo. Being burdened. Isn't that what we're experiencing now? And you're not going to experience this till you get into the truth for some time. And you get miserable. Now, Billy's, what are you, 27? It's really hard living 27 years old. 
and listening to this truth because your hormones are running 150 miles an hour and you got its energy and you want to kind of you're kind of at a place where you want to enjoy the flesh it's really difficult it's it's something that you have to go through when you're young you get about halfway there at 40 then you get up in your 50s and 60s and you're saying, man, none of this turned out the way I thought it was supposed to be. I'm miserable with this crazy world and God's brought me into the truth. And you get tired, of, you get fed up with it, don't you? you fed up with the world, not for that we should be unclothed. It's not that we just want to commit suicide and die. But clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. We want to get rid of the mortal body that heart attacks, heart operations. I've had heart operations, eye operations, hemorrhoid operations, tonsil operations, uh, lung bronchoscopies, colonoscopies, hemorrhoidectomy. I've had my body cut all to pieces. Got to go back probably and have something done shortly. I'm getting tired of my body. It's wearing out. That's what it is. This is the change here. But he, now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When we are absent from the body, the body goes to sleep over here. It's corrupt. It starts decaying. It starts rotting. What happens to the spirit? It goes to be with the Lord. There's two sections to your, to your person. There's that intellect it goes into the presence of God, and that is what God brings back with him. Those that sleep, the body's over there in a grave, rotting, and then he brings back from the sleep those that are in the presence of Christ. He brings them back. We don't go out before them. They hit the ground. Their bodies are changed, and then we go out to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what it's teaching. Do you see that? Huh? Well, how he's going to do it? He's God. That's the only way he's going to do it. How's he going to take somebody who's been thrown overboard in the ocean and uh, their bodies died and some shark ate them and, and they became dung out of the shark's bottom and, and then some, it fertilized something else and went into some other fish and... and we may have some of George Washington's genes in us. We don't know that. I mean, you can have anything going on in your body. You may have Napoleon's, um, some of Napoleon's minerals going up to your body. You don't know. Heavy. <laughs> Heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, so to be absent with the body, the body's going to be over here. Let's just put it this way. Here's the body over here. Down here, right? There's the body, but that's what's asleep. Here we are up here. This is our conscience. That's going to be with the Lord. And those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him back when he comes to appear in the air. They will hit the ground. We'll not go before those that are asleep. I don't know I say hit the ground. I guess that's the way it's put. Then they'll rise first, and in the twinkling of an eye, We'll go out to meet the Lord in the air together, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can you see that? It's not going to be a fleshly body. It's going to be a new body. We're going to be changed into a new body that has no sin nature. Won't that be great? I, I mean, what is it? What is a perfect body like? Does it breathe oxygen? I don't know. I don't care. You know, I mean, it's not going to have sin in it. It's not going to have the desires for the flesh because it's not going to be flesh. Isn't that great? Now, huh? That's right. We'll be like Jesus for we shall see him as he is. Now, let's go back to the 20th chapter of Revolution. Now, those are the things we have to understand. All right. Now, 
I'm trying to get through this. Reviewing this is very ne necessary. All right, we're going to be changed at the last trump. That's going to be the coming of the Lord. I don't know where these guys come up with their foolishness. They, they don't look at these things. They, they're not paying any attention. Back to verse 1 of chapter 20. The only place where you get millennium, the study of millennium, is in Revelation 20. Millennium comes from the word mill and annum. Mill is, mill is thousand, annum is years. That's a bad translation. This is not a millennium. We do not believe in a millennium after this is all over. We don't believe in it. Because the, even the church didn't teach it. Here's what we believe. We believe Adam was here. Adam was given the law of God. He was given the law in his flesh. He knew what was right and wrong in the flesh. Moses certainly had the written law on tables of stone. But we believe Adam, Moses, and all of us, all the way to the end of time, we are saved by grace through faith. That's what we're saved by. We're not saved by the law, but we obey the law because God gave us the law. And the law is more than just, I said it this morning, it's every imperative mood that you find in Scripture when Jesus would say, strive to enter into the straight gate, strive agonizomai, that's a command of God. Humble yourself under the hand of God, that's a command of God, that's the law of God. So we're living not just by this law, it's a law written in our hearts as spiritual Jews. We believe the Jew up to Jesus, Jesus was literal, and they were also spiritual, because everybody that was a Jew didn't get to go to heaven, and God destroyed the unbelieving Israelite, which, was, which wasn't the true Jew. If they were just a literal Israelite, they had to be believing God. Joshua believed God. Elijah believed God. These men, are the, the prophets believed God. They were spiritual Jews, and most of them were literal Jews at the same time. So, being a Jew is not, a, it is spiritual, it always has been. But the rituals were blotted out when Jesus came, and the Jew and Israel and the temple all became spiritual. Now, I'm not going to go through that. I've got dozens and dozens of tapes on this. If you want that, uh, you can get that along the way. We believe the Jew is from the beginning all the way to the end. Or let me just put it this way. God's Israel, God's called people. They had the literal law. We've got the spiritual law written on our hearts. And a Jew is not outwardly, but of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. Let's go back to the first verse. Now, it seems like for some that haven't heard me that I am skipping some things. I'm not skipping them. I've already taught on them in great detail. And I'm not going to go back and cover them all tonight. Now, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. One more time, bottomless pit. You can't even teach it without teaching what bottomless pit is. Not a hole in the ground. You find the scorpions, the false teachers, coming up out of the bottomless pit in the ninth chapter of Revelation. In the eleventh chapter of Revelation, you find the beast. The beast is like a lion, a bear, and a leopard coming out of the pit. And we know that what that is, that's Babylon, Persia, Greece. And then Rome being a composite of these three, we find that beast in Daniel, the seventh chapter, now, we know that Babylon, literal Babylon, little Persia, little Greece, and literal Rome did not come out of a hole in the ground, or they did not come out of hell. Bottomless pit is the word A-B-U-S-S-O-S. Abusos. It comes from bathos. It's a construction of bathos. Bathos means something with great intellectual depth or understanding. Now, one fellow said, why do you always talk about the awful privity? Because it's all over. I'm sorry, but it's in all these words in the New Testament. You take the alpha as a negative particle, call the alpha privity, put it in front of a word. It negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. Placing the alpha in front of bathos, 
means, it translates abusos, it means a place of no intellectual depth or understanding. That's where the beast comes from. That's where the scorpions or the false teachers come from. A place of no knowledge. That's, this is idiomatic language. It's, it's not a hole in the ground with helicopters coming out of it. <laughs> Golly, how Lindsay has got rocks in his head. Whew, if you define these words, you'd find out. What gets me, you look up the word bottomless pit in your concordance and you find the beast coming out of it. The same beast as Old Testament. It, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. You find the scorpions, the false teachers coming out of it. And when you find it throughout this, and you find Satan locked up in it. He's locked up for some reason. Well, look at verse 2. He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent. I said it this morning, dragon doesn't mean a fire-breathing dragon. He's not talking about something out of medieval times when they went out and jousted with a dragon. That is some myth or fairy tale. He laid hold of the smooth talker. The dracon, the fascinator. And he locked him up and limited him in the place of no knowledge for a purpose. <sighs> he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Well, gosh, I hate to have to go through this. But somebody listening to this is not going to understand if they never heard this tape before. Now, that's not talking about a thousand year reign after this is all over. The key is in the word bound and the key is in the word thousand. Bound is the word dio. It means to forbid, to declare unlawful. It, in certain senses, it means to declare guilty. It, of course, is the word opposite of luo, which means to permit or to declare lawful or innocent. Now, Satan is going to be placed in a place of no knowledge in the world, and he's going to be forbidden from doing something. For a thousand years. Except the word is not thousand. That's a bad translation. The word is kilia. C-H-I-L-I-A. Kilia. Kilia is plural. One more time. One thousand to the Jewish mind was not plural. The Jews said multiple of ten, a hundred or a thousand was a form of the original number. Ten was a perfect secular number. Ten, a hundred, or a thousand was a form of one when multiplied times one. The Greek said one was not a number. This is written in the Greek language, in the Greek world, from a Greek perspective. One was not a number. They said one was a generator of numbers. They did not start counting or say plural was till they got to two. The word kilia cannot mean 1,000. It has to mean 2,000 or more. What is the binding of Satan? One more time, Matthew the 12th chapter. Here's the binding of Satan. Right here. Matthew the 12th chapter. Here's Satan bound. Matthew 12. Well, in verse 28, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God, which was another name for Israel, and we're spiritual Israel, is coming to you. Or else, how can one man enter into a strong man's house, implying Satan has been living in us before Christ comes to live in us, and spoil his goods, which is self, which is fulfillment of the flesh, except he first bind the strong man, implying Satan, and the binding, that is the same word, Dio. Unless he first binds Satan for a 2,000 year period, 
from Christ until the end of time, there is a 2,000 year period where Satan is going to be forbidden from doing something. The next verse tells us what it is in Revelation 20. He's going to be forbidden from doing something. Let's look at it, Revelation 20. And he cast him into the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge. That is the same thing as the seas of Revelation 13 and 1 where the beast is rising up out of the sea of people. The beast rose up out of the sea and the, and the waters where the woman sits is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the beast rises up out of the place of no knowledge. And in the ancient world, that's what they considered all the world. Now the, now the beast is a world system rising up out of a world system that has no knowledge of God. And Satan is forbidden from doing something in this third verse. Cast him into the place of no knowledge of the world, the peoples of the world, the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, where the woman sits... That's Babylon that's reigned over the kings of the earth and shut him up and set a seal upon him that. That is a preposition. It's about to tell you why he's bound. That he should deceive the nations no more Till the 2,000 years was finished. 2,000 is the more the correct translation than 1,000. 1,000 is a bad translation. Yeah. The word nations is the word ethnos. Ethnos is our word ethnic. It means non-Jews. If you notice something that it doesn't say on there... It does not say he'll be bound from deceiving the Jews. He'll be forbidden from deceiving the Jews because the literal Jews are going to be fooled for these last 2,000 years. They're not going to be believing that Jesus is the Messiah. They are blinded. This deception is only to keep him from deceiving Gentile elect predestinated believers for a 2,000 year period there is a certain number of Gentiles he is going to be forbidden from deceiving for that period of time. Now what is the 2,000? What is that specifically? 2 Peter 3 here's the 2,000. There's a couple of verses I'll give you here. 2 Peter, the third chapter. <clears throat> 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, there's a 2,000-year period or a two-day period where the Gentile elect church of God, the all flesh of Acts 2, God has given his, his word to the one flesh, to the Jews of the Old Testament, and for a 2,000-year period, that has, that, has to do with the, that has to do with the Gentile elect church not being deceived, Satan is going to be forbidden. You say, Jim, that's not all the Gentiles in the world. That's true, but you have to remember something. The Jews believed that a part of something was the whole of something. A part of a day was the whole. A part of the body was the whole. So a part of the Gentiles, if one person out of each family, I'm not going to go into that to any great extent right now, but if any part of a family was saved and there will be Gentile elect out of every nation, tongue, and tribe, therefore the whole of mankind, as far as they are concerned, the whole of the Gentile nations is become believers in the Gentile elect church. You say, what do you mean the whole? Wasn't the entire world saved with eight people? 
from the flood, the entire world would be saved, or the whole will be saved, in the Gentile elect that, that Satan will be forbidden from deceiving for the last 2,000 years. That's called the last days. Now, I believe, I realize that from, the, from Adam until Christ, God counts, when you go into Scripture, God doesn't count the way we count. He left out certain generations because of sin. According to Scripture, what God counts was four days. One, two, three, four days from Adam until Christ. Six is the number of man. I do not know when Jesus is coming. We're right close to the end of the sixth day. Now, we know that in Acts, the second chapter, Acts, the second chapter, Peter stood and said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days this would happen. If Peter said in Acts 2, this is what Joel said would happen in the last days, then in Acts 2, the last days are here, aren't they? The last days are here in Acts 2. The thing about it, we don't know. We know Jesus was born somewhere from 4 B.C. back to maybe 17 to 20 B.C. We're not really sure because the calendar was redone by a monk who was off for sure for four years, maybe up to 17 or 18 years. We know that, that the Acts 2 these guys who try to come up and pinpoint days of Jesus' death on a calendar, you cannot trust the chronology of the calendars. None of them are reliable. All we're going to know is the approximate time. The Scripture says no man knows the day nor the hour that he'll come, but it does not say we will not know the season. You're not the children of the darkness there in the, seventh, in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. You're not the children of the darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. We're not in the darkness, we're in the light. He says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, there in Matthew 24, then lift up your head and look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. When you see these things, know it is nigh even at the doors. We'll know the season. We will not know the exact time. We do not know the exact calendars. We know that Acts 2 was somewhere in the neighborhood of 29, maybe up to 35 A.D. Now, I believe that if we could measure time the way God measures it and we had an exact calendar, we'd know about when he's coming. But he says, I'm going to give you signs so that you'll know. Even if, even if it was as late as 40 A.D., even if the last day started at Pentecost, I don't know whether the last day started with the birth of Jesus, whether they started at Pentecost, but I do know they were here at Pentecost. I know that. And I'm giving you speculation. I'm not telling you something that's going to happen. Very seldom do I use speculation. I'm saying if it is true that a day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. If, if it's 2,000 years, which I believe it is, let's measure 2,000 years from 35 A.D. That would take us to 2035. But we already know that we're four to 17 maybe 20 years off, subtract that off of, subtract four years off of this, subtract seven years off of this. What if it's 2029? I don't know. I'm not saying that's when the Lord's coming. I'm saying that the last days, I believe, are the last 2,000 years. Let me give you some reasons I believe that, okay? Let's go and look at some of this in Scripture. Let's go over here to, uh, goodness, I got so much on it. Isaiah 2. Let's go to Isaiah 2. Isaiah, the second chapter. I'm going to try to give you some things I haven't given in a long time. Now, let me erase this because I'm going to need the board. All right. Last days. 
Do not go away repeating that I said this would happen. I'm saying we're living in the last days now because we were living in the last days in Acts the second chapter. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that a day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. This is enough to frighten anybody. If, if, if this is true, then we're headed towards the end. Besides that, look at the great apostasy that's going on around us. Look at the great deception. Look at all the prophecy we've preached on through the years. Look at the 70 weeks of Daniel. We have to be nearing the end of time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even have time to go there. It's too much. May 14, 1948, the Jews became a nation for the first time in 2,600 years and got the temple site back in the Six-Day War of 1967. They're not the literal Jew. God is using them. They're not the spiritual Jew unless they come through Christ. God is using them. I'm not saying that they're going to be the literal Israel, the spiritual Israel. The only way they can become the spiritual Israel if they turn and come through Christ, that's all. Now, let me explain something to you in Isaiah, the second chapter, and in Isaiah, the 65th chapter. Because this is where they use some of this. This is where they get the thousand years right here. They get a thousand years here in Isaiah, the second chapter. Let's look, starting here in the first verse. <clears throat> Isaiah 2. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days. In the last days, this is going to come to pass. The last days started, and it was here in Acts 2. You think God changes the meaning of the last days over here from the New Testament? I think not. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house. What is the mountain of God? The Lord's house. That's Zion, isn't it? That's Zion. Now, these people who believe in a thousand year reign after this is over with, they believe that this chapter is talking about from the end of time to the end of a thousand years. I don't know why that's not called the end of time. You know, I mean... Doesn't even make any sense, does it? The end of time is here, and then you got a thousand years, and that's time too. Does that make any sense? Duh. All right. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, two mountains in the world, Babylon, Zion. Zion is where the house of God sits. Now, what they're trying to say is that there's going to be all these pagan nations during this time period, and the house of God is going to be built on literal Zion, and they're going to all come to it during that thousand-year period. That's what they're saying this is talking about. How can that be true when the last days comes with Jesus, and you've got a 2,000-year here period, and then you've got the end of time? What is Zion now? Well, let's look at it. Hebrews 12 and 22. Let's look at it. Hebrews 12 and 22. What is Zion now? Everything is spiritual now. Was literal at one time. Hebrews 12. How much time do I have, Mike? What? I got to have more time than that. Hebrews 12, 22. Hebrews 12... Verse 22. But ye are coming to Mount Zion during the 2,000 year period of doing the last days. You're come to Mount Zion unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Well, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that we be the firstborn among many brethren. We're the firstborn. Zion, Isaiah is talking about all the way through this book, God extending the gospel or bringing the light to the Gentiles during the last days or the last 2,000 years. 
That's right. Spiritual Israel. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, what would that be? What is the house of God? Hebrews, the sixth chapter. That Christ is a son of his own house. There in Hebrews 6, look, uh, 3 and verse 6, Christ is a son of his own house, whose house are we. We're the house of God. So this is talking about all nations or Gentile elect coming to the house of God in the last days or the last 2,000 years. Can you see that? That's what it's talking about. Isaiah's prophecies all the way through the book was talking about the Gentiles coming to the light during the last days or the last 2,000 years when God would pour out of His Spirit, His truth, on the all flesh instead of just the Jewish flesh of the Old Testament. And shall be established in the top of the mountains. What does that mean? What are the mountains of the world? The capital cities of the world. A mountain was a capital city, a ruling city of an empire. The church is going to be in every city of the earth. It is going to be established as a mountain in all the cities, and it will be the mountain of God, and they will not be able to destroy us. And we'll lie down with the beast during the last days, like a lamb, like Micah says, and we won't be hurt or destroyed. The Lord's house shall be established in the top of all the cities, the capital cities of the world, and shall be exalted above the hills in all nations. It's the Old Testament word for ethnos. It's the word goy. It's not talking about all nations flowing to the house of God during a thousand-year reign. It's talking about all the elect that God forbids Satan from deceiving flowing to the house of God, which is heavenly Jerusalem, the church. That's what this is, spiritual pictures. Can you see that? What's it's talking about? This is talking about during, during the last 2,000 years, those that Satan has been forbidden from deceiving the ethnos, the goyim, the word is goy or goyim, G-O-Y or G-O-Y-I-M. I love that word goyim. One of the words means a flight of locusts. That's the Gentiles. Don't need him need to go there. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Let us go up to the church. Let us go. We're not talking about church building. We're talking about the ecclesia, the called out of God. Let us go and be part of the church. All of the elect that are not deceived, that God forbids, Satan is going to be bound in the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge from deceiving these elect. And then he's going to put it into their hearts to say, let us go up to the house of God. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about a thousand year reign and they're all going to go these heathens are going to go and worship around the throne of God that doesn't even make any sense does it to the house of the God of Jacob he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law out of the church and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem heavenly Jerusalem the church of the firstborn will be preaching and the goyim, or the ethnos, will come to the house of God in the last days or the last 2,000 years. And he shall judge among the nations, and we are priests and kings, and we are to judge righteous judgment, and shall rebuke many people, and this is good. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. He's talking about the nation or the goyim, which is the elect church, will beat their swords into plowshares. It's not talking about, we're going to have a time of peace with a bunch of heathens going up to the house of God here. It's talking about the church during this time period will not fight battles with the world. That's what I was fixing to read. 
the 18th chapter of John, Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. During the 2,000-year period, when the nations of the world, the elect, the elect that Satan is forbidden from deceiving, they will come to the church, God will put it in their hearts, and we will no longer fight the beast or anyone else. That's the time period. We're not beating our swords into plowshares. Look at that in John the... In John the 18th chapter. Boy, that's what the 2,000 years is talking about. I'll come back next week to this. John 18. Now for those of you that have been here listening to this. It's, be, it's, it's easier to understand. Verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. Spiritually, we have beaten our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, and we, we study war no more during this 2,000-year period. That's... If I had... You know what... I need to take all the verses of Isaiah where he's talking about the Gentiles coming to his light, delivering the... This is the spirits in prison that he's delivering during the 2,000-year period, during the last days. Well, 37 of what? Well, all right, I'll read there. Pilate therefore said, Art thou king of the Jews? Thou sayest that I am king, to this end was I born, for this cause came out into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that's the elect. And I'm out of time, ain't I? Oh, me. Neither shall they learn war anymore. We're not going to learn war when the nations of the world, the Gentile elect, come up to the house of God, to heaven and Jerusalem, Mount Zion. This is not talking about a thousand year period. And this is one of the favorite seg sections of verses of the dispensation. Say, see, all the heathens are going to come up to the house of God. For what? <laughs> During a thousand year period. Why? You mean to worship God and they're heathens? If you notice all the holes you can punch in that thousand year reign. Yeah. There's no time no more. Yeah. Without death, there is no time. That's right. So if they're saying there's still a thousand years, then that's just ignorant because it time is no more. <laughs> that's what I've been saying. It's ignorant. <laughs> it's ignorant. <laughs> it's ignorant. <laughs> time comes to an end and then you got a thousand years of time. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna come back to the two thousand years next week. We're gonna come back to it quicker than we did this week. Seems like I have to review rapture and everything to let you really see this thing is such a big, huge picture. I've got to show you in the 65th chapter of Isaiah next week where the, where the dispensationalists talk about how a child will die a hundred years. Uh, they'll die, and that's where they say he's living into the tribulation. He's 300 years old dying here. How can that be when death is destroyed at, th at the changing of our bodies? I want to go into that. These are some of their favorite verses that they use to pervert and twist the Word of God. I'll come back to the 2000 next week, and we'll come back to this same spot and uh, review a little, but I'll not review as much. I, I can't, do you know you can't hardly teach? Do you know the entire book of Revelation is about the last trump? You can't hardly teach you without teaching the last trump. Because you've got the seven angels and they're going all the way to the end of the book. And they keep coming up. And they're the ones that's got the seven trumpets. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to continue this ministry and this message. God, I pray that you'll give me the health and strength to serve many years for you here to lead the church. And God, prepare some of these young men. Lord, cause them to study and to learn, to dig into your word. Give them a hunger that you've never given them. 
Lord, give me that hunger even more and more every day so I can understand your book, impart it to the people until the day I die. God will give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen.